please use the telephone number provided in the chat box. This webinar event is also being live captioned. Please look for the web link in the chat box. It is at this link that you can access the live captions. And while we hope that you don't, you may also leave the webinar at any time by closing the WebEx window. Note that today's webinar will be recorded and made available, complete with captions, within a week following today's event. All participants will receive an email with the link to the recording. If you have any technical questions, please feel free to type those into the chat box as well, and we will do our best to get you the appropriate answers. And with that, let's get started. Today's webinar is entitled Critical Thinking in a Crisis. Our presenter is Dr. Jennifer Schneider, the Eugene Fram Chair in Critical Thinking at RIT. Dr. Schneider is a principal in the Collaboratory for Resilience and Recovery at RIT and a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering Technology, Environmental Management, and Safety. Her research interests include critical infrastructure emergency planning and disaster management and application of risk analysis and systems theory to determine community level critical infrastructure, impact on emergency management systems and target capabilities. She, is also, she also studies exposure assessment, modeling of exposure scenarios, particularly hazardous material emergencies, and requisite response planning, multidimensional sustainability and analysis of sector-based corporate sustainability, related activities, and management systems are also an area of interest. Whew! In other words, Dr. Schneider is the person cities call when everything goes wrong. She has been the PI of over $1 million in research funding and a co-PI, principal investigator, or senior personnel on another $600,000 of funded research efforts. Jen, take it away. Well, um, I have to say I listened to that, that intro and I'm, I'm a little stunned at that. I think uh, we could have made that a lot simpler and a lot shorter. Um, when I was thinking about this presentation, I, re I really struggled a bit with this. Um, what can I say about the vast world of critical thinking in a crisis uh, that would be something that was accessible? Uh, it certainly doesn't sound like a fun topic, um, but I wanted to put forth an agenda, if you will, a call to action. Um, then I thought, uh, we all think, and certainly RIT alum are big thinkers, you made it through uh, this university, so let's get into why we need to, what's important, and how we do it. So um, here goes. So uh, first thing to think about here is um, what are we really dealing with? You heard my intro, but what you really need to remember is at the end of the day, I'm a hazmat responder. Um, my call sign is Chicken Little. <laughs> sure, that has something to do with my stature. For those that have met me, you know I don't quite make five feet tall. Um, but it also has to do with my uncanny ability to figure out where the sky might fall. Now, this is a good skill uh, if you're responding to crises and an emergency, certainly. Um, but uh, it's not great to trot out at parties, really. Um, it's not something that gets people happy. It can certainly be a downer. Um, but if you can figure out the downside to anything, uh, you can also figure out the upside and how to get there. And this, uh, my friends, is really the opportunity that I'm going to talk about today. So. What's our agenda? Um, pretty simply, our world is not getting easier. We all know this. It's more complex in faster evolution. So the question is, how can we not only learn to live in what the world is, but how can we learn to live well? Get beyond survival to thriving. So and just to start with a bit of a background example, in this case, I'm using the issue of climate change. Um, we certainly know that it's upon us. In addition to that, we have a complex world full of strife, strife. We have political issues, certainly, especially today, and one that is technologically evolving as well. Status quo is not the status anymore. If you think about it, the ministers account for about a fifth of our total humanitarian assistance. Beyond that, 
we had at least 800 major disaster loss events in 2013, quite a few. And due to that climate change and our increasing population, particularly around the coast, as you can see on the underlying map, our 100-year massive storms are now predicted to occur approximately every 50 years or maybe less. And these storms cost upwards of $100 billion or more. So let's step back a bit. What makes community resilience? So it really is a system of systems. In this particular presentation, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about the human side of this and the physical, infrastructural side of this. Now, the human side is really the most complex, as you might think. It is complex as the people that are in it, and it's born from their collective capabilities, the individual capabilities that add up to the community capabilities. We all contribute to that, some more than others, certainly, but it's our contributions that add up to whether we can thrive or not. So I am a professor, so I have to start with, with something that, that makes you think, right? So you're going to see a question, polling question pop up on your screen. I'd like you to take a shot at it. How many pieces of critical infrastructure are there in a mid-sized region like Rochester? So of all the things that make our community run, all those pieces and parts that we put together from the water, the lights, the transportation, emergency services, and so forth, 18 different sectors that contribute, how many do you think we actually have that contribute to the running of our daily life? And again, a reminder that if you are in the full screen view, you'll need to go back to the traditional view in order to see and, and participate in the polling question. All right, let's, uh, let's see what our results are. It's, it's pretty interesting. Most of you thought that there's no answer. Well, um, I uh, kind of beg to differ with you there a bit. It turns out that for Rochester and most mid-sized regions of about a million people or so, there typically is somewhere between 300 and 350 different pieces of critical infrastructure in the region. And that's because critical infrastructure is something that's got to be able to impact the entire community. So let me explain a little bit. Now, if I was living on a particular neighborhood street and there was a problem with the street where it would be impassable, that would certainly be an issue for me as a resident, but it may not be an issue for the folks that live across town, not necessarily community critical. On the other hand, for those of you that remember Rochester, if I, say, took out Jefferson Road in front of the campus or even the New York State I-90 throughway, that certainly is something that's critical that would impact a lot of folks. So when we measure on potential impact, which is how all this stuff goes, we end up with that 3 to 350 range. So in a particular community, you might have, oh, somewhere around two to 3,000 pieces of infrastructure, but only about 10% of them or so are things that are actually considered critical. Okay, so let's move on from the question. Some basics for you here. First, I'd like you to, to take a look at this, um, this uh, particular um, timeline that I've got here. The problem here is to look at a process that has a um, beginning, middle, and end with it. And with that, you'll take a look that our recovery is in short-term, intermediate, and long-term, and they actually overlap. So in every part of that process, we have an opportunity to insert a decision that could help us recover faster. And recovery really runs along a process that starts with a crisis, runs through recovery, and gets back to resiliency. And in this case, resiliency doesn't mean that we are re returning to absolute normal from before the event. We're returning to a new normal, if you will. It's important that criticality is really defined by both what we do in the crisis and what happens as a result of it under a time constraint. Okay. Some important notes here also, and I love this cartoon at the bottom of my slide. 
Disasters don't happen every day. That's why they're called disasters, right? But whether it's a small crisis at an individual level, an emergency that's a collective problem, or disaster that's really huge, every one of those represents an opportunity space for us where we can think about what our possibilities of resolving the problem at hand are through a better knowledge of the aspects, impacts, capacity, and capability for decision making and operationalizing or putting that decision into act action. Now, I'm going to go back and talk about these words in some detail in a minute, but I want to step back for one more important point. The idea of critical thinking is about making decisions to improve things, not just running them to, oops, they fail. This is important. We have to take the opportunities that are given to make those informed decisions. Now, sometimes, in many times, our world forces us to make quick decisions and move on. This can be fine in plenty of contexts, but there are also times we have to stop and carefully, critically think, literally before the bridge breaks. So we move into the second part of the presentation here. How do we make those informed decisions that we have to be smarter and more measured in our information, both at that individual and collective level? Remember, community decision making is a collective in, but individual set of decisions all of us collectively to get the result. So I can't help putting out some maps here. I, I love these things. This is my first uh, integrated community management system map. There's not going to be a quiz on this. But I wanted you to know, uh, this is really what we look at when we're trying to look at a community's capability to thrive and survive in crisis. Every one of these arrows represents an opportunity to have an intervention in how we spend money, what decisions we make, and how we implement processes. Now, if we're at RIT and I count myself in the geeky set, we can really geek this up a lot. And we can take a look at the particular inputs into the system, like those that I've got in the red circle in front of you. And this, at the beginning of the system, as you might expect, is where we can uh, put the most impact into the process. In that, we can look at aspects, like I mentioned earlier. These are the things that are unique to the decision or the community. What are the things that make it run? In the case of the community, is that community sitting, say, on a floodplain, on a coast, on top of an earthquake fault, or in the middle of a war zone? Then we can take a look at what capacities we can bring to bear against that risk. What are our critical operations, key resources, the infrastructure that we have available? What are the risks that come from those aspects? And how much capability, how tough, how trained are our people? And finally, when we get to the true capability of the entire system, what kind of results can we have? What do we expect? So at the CRR, the uh, Collaboratory for Resiliency and Recovery that, that I'm a part of at RIT, we do a lot of work to assess community resilience and help individual communities with what they need to do to create that future that they seek. I'm giving you some snippets for this, and I can't help it, but I've got to show you a little bit of math about how we deal with capacity here, and then determine maturity and capability level. But this can be done at a much simpler level. I want to show you my capacity problem for the other night when uh, I needed a midnight snack. So what is my disaster possibility, my aspects? Well, geez, I needed to get a snack. Uh, what's important here? Am I going to have a flood or a fire, or do I simply need some cookies? What are my options? Well, what capacity do I have? Do I have the ingredients to make those cookies? The mixer. Um, many times our decisions are really bounded by what is possible. Now, luckily, in my case, I happen to have some cookie dough in the freezer. Oh, thank God, because it was one of those nights. And as you'll notice, I also had a nice bottle of wine. So it turned out all right. But that same sort of decision process of what's the problem, what do I have available, what are the tools at my disposal, and how can I move this process forward are the same whether I'm dealing with my midnight snack or I'm dealing with an entire community. So, you know, pretty great. In this instance, I solved my problem in under 20 minutes. A disaster in a community isn't quite that simple, certainly. 
So one of the things that we do with the um, Collaboratory for Resiliency and Recovery is we look a lot at the decision process and the data that we can give to decision makers to help them make smarter decisions. And of course, um, just like daily life in, dis in disasters, we need to make informed decisions fairly quickly, but importantly, they need to be informed. On the left, you'll see a small part of a larger decision system that we have for an emergency operations center. So every branch is an opportunity to contribute a small decision leading to the larger one that hopefully will allow that community to survive and thrive. On the right, we've data mined uh, several million, I think about six million 911 records to find clusters of where and when fires might occur in a community. What location, neighborhood, what style of house or infrastructure. Just imagine if you could predict the next emergency based on smart use of historical or emerging data. And you know what? At the CRR, we're getting close. But there are other things you can do besides predicting or, or uh, dealing with the decision at hand. You can also use decision theory to look at resiliency challenges. Some of you might know about the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative by the Rockefeller Foundation that started uh, just over three years ago now. Uh, in this particular initiative, Rockefeller committed $100 million to help 100 cities do something about their collective resilience. And they asked cities to apply for the money, and the cities had to identify their particular challenges. So we were curious. For those cities that started this process early, the first 30 or so of the cities, how well were they doing after they had done some collective work and some projects to increase their resilience? Was it happening? So we took a look at different buckets of the issues that a city might deal with, social and economic, infrastructural, weather and natural events. A lot of times these weather and natural events really are uh, natural events that occur without a whole lot of warning. For example, flooding issues from hurricanes or earthquakes, that sort of thing. Or man-made events. Um, many man-made events could be war, political strife, those sorts of things. Um, we then map them across uh, our uh, Likert scale. You'll see at the bottom on the x-axis of the screen a, ma a maturity scale that goes from zero to five, five being the most mature. Your city is very resilient. It can handle most shocks that's going to come its way. Um, when we looked at both the type of uh, issues that the community had and its potential to manage those or its maturity, what we found is most cities ran about the two, three, or four level. They had some emergency capacity, but not necessarily enough to make something resilient over time. So this is true whether we're talking about cities or back at my cookie dough. A lot of this has to do with the level of preparation that's out there. It should make sense, right? The fact that I had cookie dough in the freezer made my challenge to resolve my midnight snack pretty easy. Um, whether it's a shock to the system and an unknown crisis that's going to occur or not, we need to have some preparation, some mitigation to, to, help, to help head off the crisis. Now, at our collaboratory, we can do these kinds of analyses at a single business level, a community level, where we've done quite a few, or even a country level, because each connection in a decision system is a point to measure and make that decision for impact. Okay, so let's get into some things that are going to make you think. We want to create some resiliency for ourselves and our world. How do we do this? Simply, we start thinking. Here's your second opportunity to vote. So everyone should, can go ahead and, and take a look at that second polling question. What would you choose to do first in a crisis situation in your neighborhood? Seek a safe place, look for others, grab your pets, pack personal mementos, or try to figure out if it was over.
we seem to have a, uh, the, the majority of people say they're going to look for a safe place. I think the question is, how would you do that? Um, with some others saying that they would look for others um, and grab your beloved pets, of course, and then try to figure out if it was over comes in third. Personal memento seem to not rank very high, so we're not sentimental people, apparently. <laughs> All right. So uh, this, is, this is an interesting one from my perspective. First of all, I'm going to let you know it's not a trick question, but there isn't a perfect answer. Um, what I was really getting at is your method of making a decision, right? So we were fairly, fairly uh, split on this, except for the memento part of it, the answer. So the, the interesting thing here is, of course, we'd want to seek a safe place for ourselves. Well, how do you do that? If you look at the top of the screen on the, on the right-hand part of the screen, this happens to be after Hurricane Andrew, by the way, uh, a picture from that, you'll notice it doesn't look like anybody's neighborhood anymore. And this is really key to crisis thinking. We all can deal with a crisis if the environment around us looks somewhat familiar. We have cues to, to help us make our decisions. But the more and more that particular environment doesn't look like what we're used to or doesn't operate like we're used to, that becomes when we really have to delve into some quick, critical thinking. And even so, you can see there in, on the right that we have cars floating, we have half a tree. Um, we're going to use those to try to figure out where we are. Now think about this if I was an emergency responder and I managed to, to notice somebody floating in this debris. First of all, that would probably be pretty lucky considering how much is there. But I managed to, to see someone. How do I tell the next responder to help me? Go look left of the tree that's floating too? Um, we don't have a signpost. We don't have a road. We certainly have a difficult time giving directions. So let's go to the left a little bit. Here we're looking at the Northeast blackout uh, that happened, I think, about 15 years ago, if I, if I uh, remember correctly. So in this sense, the world still does look the same, right? Um, we can identify the street. We certainly see people and cars moving in a direction. But what don't we have in this case? We don't have a whole lot of help guiding us. So the environment is fine, but the guides are not. We don't have street lights. We may not have enough policemen to get people in and out of areas. We may have difficulty because uh, the uh, infrastructure isn't working, particularly the uh, electrical infrastructure, with having a charged cell phone to make a call. And by the way, um, in that charged cell phone trying to make a call, as we know from 9-11 and beyond, there might be too many trying to do it at the same time. This, even though it looks the same, is still a problem because it doesn't operate the same way. So when we go back to our questions and our poll questions and our answers, seeking a safe place, it's a little hard to figure out on the right. It's a little easier on the left, although we probably are trying to call other people and figure out where our collective family or tribe, if you will, our friends are. Um, and look for others and grab your pets. We know, particularly from Hurricane Katrina, uh, we saw this uh, fairly ubiquitously, many people would choose not to leave, not to evacuate, despite dire warnings because they didn't want to leave their pets behind. This is one of the reasons why FEMA now has pretty robust plans for what, 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 excuse me, what we do with pets during emergencies. Because Fido or Fifi, the cat, the dog, the hamster, I even heard in one of the last disasters, uh, FEMA dealt with some poisonous snakes that belonged to someone. Um, all of those are very, very important to people. In the same way, personal mementos, you'd be surprised how many people actually go back for wedding pictures or the picture of grandpa or something that, that means a lot to them. And then, Finally, I put in there, try to figure out if it was over. This is what the real problem is in any, in any emergency or disaster. This is the question that everybody actually asks themselves. Is it over? Because if it's over and I'm still standing, then I can make a much more informed decision about what to do next because the, the world is not evolving around me. I'm not going to get another wave or tsunami. I'm not going to have more of the infrastructure go away. Um, you know, my lights are out on the left, but is water going to shut off? Is heat going to shut off? What does that look like? 
So honestly, if I was looking at the list, my first response as a responder would probably be the one on the bottom. Try to figure out if it was over. And then that would inform where my safe place might be. And some of this, as I said at the beginning, is really built around what your personal orientation is. We make decisions based upon who we are in our collective experience. Do you have a process orientation? Do you have a personal protection orientation? Or are you going to go and try to save other people? Is that part of your construct and who you are? In all of this, it's really important to understand that context, what you see and where you are and your experience, really inform that decision. It's also practice and capability driven. And I'll get to practice in a second. But I want to talk a bit about capability. Just think about my five foot self in hazmat suit or not, trying to swim my way to safety in that picture on the left. I don't think I'd be all that successful. So many times our collective decisions, whether they're in crisis or in regular life, have to do with our personal capability, what we think we can do. And that, my friends, is really driven by our ability to practice. Okay, somehow I have a click that moved on top of another click. Let me see if I can move that back. There we go. All right. So this is not a quiz either. I just wanted to show you a really neat diagram that I've got. Um, this is OODA looping. Observe, orient, design, and act. This was uh, originally used by the, the military. It is a way for commanders to essentially understand the scene and then determine where to act from there. And it's all about driving informed decisions. Now, this works in both crisis, military, and in everyday daily life. Now, do I expect you to go through a huge observation process, a major orientation process, a written down decision with all of your implicit inputs and then do an action? Well, if you're on a battlefield in a crisis, probably not. But believe it or not, you're gonna go through every one of these steps every time you critically think. Now, military leaders practice this a lot. They gather information, observe the context, act over and over and over, and learn and learn again. The key here, really, is to use that information to make an informed decision that avoids uh, preconceptions on what ought to happen, and then own it. It's yours. OK, so a bit about critical thinking here. Think about the last difficult, to figure out anyway, decision that you made. How did it go? How did you go about resolving it? Did you gather evidence, assess it, wrestle with con conflicting parts to that evidence? Um, I could make a lot of comments about our uh, election that's going on today, but I decided to avoid that. Everybody seems to have an opinion, right? And parts of every opinion could be correct. But it all causes us to step back and really wrestle with the data that we choose to employ in our decisions. What's important about that is that every time we make a decision, we actually assess how important, effective, or impactful that decision, that information is for that decision. We decide what's most important. So how do you manage uncertainty? Certainly, if, if we think about uh, the uncertainty of a decision, in a disaster, and we think about the pictures that I had up there a second ago, we're talking about environments that don't look like anything that you're used to. So uncertainty means that we've got to be able to operate and make some conclusions and conjectures that may not be borne out by anything that we can see. In other words, we can't really confirm all of the information that we may employ. So the only way to deal with this is to be sure that we understand where the uncertainty lies, and we adjust for that as we pick our final answer. So along the process, we will actually also construct arguments, reason through our options. This goes back to me trying to swim uh, after Hurricane Andrew. I don't think it would have worked terribly well. We tend to start out by going with what we know in our experience. But then we look around and we can sort of second guess ourselves. And second guessing has got a bad rap in our culture. It's not necessarily bad to go back and say, geez, does my assumption, my argument, 
pull water? Does it make sense? Okay. And then we head down to reaching our initial conclusions. What did we decide to do? Did we swim for it? Did we stay put and hold on to the tree? Probably what I would have done. And why did we do that? Again, much of that lies in how we believe our capabilities match up to the problem at hand. Now, back to the cookies for a second. Just like a crisis, cookies are driven by local individual decisions. In this case, my decision that I needed a cookie. And collectively, my husband also thought that cookies were a good idea. So I had some help pushing me in that direction. What did I know? What did I not know? Initially, I didn't know I had cookie dough in the freezer, and I was not terribly happy, even though cookies are really important to me, with the idea of hauling out the mixer and making some right then and there. And it was a happy day when I figured out that, yeah, the dough was out there just like I'd be pretty happy if I found myself a boat during the flood. So I had options, though, with the cookies. I could wait until morning, right? Nah, I decided not to because, you know, to be honest, I needed a snack. And that's part of our decision process, too. What is really acceptable to you? What, what is important? What are you willing to do or not to? Okay, so this gets to the first part of making a decision, certainly. Second part is really about going beyond that, that decision making and integrating that decision to solve the problem. We decided, now we have to put it in practice. So we need to employ that problem solving and integrate it into a process that actually creates a result. And as you'll know, on my slide I've got, this is where we get stuck. Sometimes it can be fairly easy, even in a, in a uh, disaster, to make a decision. But being willing to jump off that tree branch into the water can be pretty tough. Because once we do that, we're then putting ourselves back into the place where, voila, we have to make another decision. What direction do we go? Is this going to work? And we have to continually evaluate. But if we do that, we can actually, whether we do it wholeheartedly and with our eyes wide open or it happens to us, we can do a creative or innovative answer to the problem, make a better way. So how do we get ever better? We get beyond survival, beyond that decision. We get to the implementation of the decision, and honestly, a disaster makes you live with your choice. And a lot of times, modern life does that too. We, we have to live with what we chose. But if we practice enough, we can make our options and therefore decision better. And quality critical thinking, at the end of the day, leads to innovation and creativity. So innovation, most of the time, is not just a simple lightning bolt, but it is being prepared, better prepared for the opportunity ahead of us. So let's walk through some of the things that we're doing now at RIT. We've realized that critical thinking is a really important skill that we have to be overt in the way that we teach it and do it here. So this is important whether it's in crisis or daily regular life, and building a skill that is something to practice at RIT and beyond. So the mission is pretty straightforward, right? We're here to engage, make decisions, grow faculty, staff, and particularly student capacity to do applied critical thinking. But we need to do it in a way that actually makes an impact, not just a thought. So one of the things that we do is we teach about 600 applied critical thinking courses annually. These are officially designated critical thinking courses that go from the first courses that a student takes at RIT all the way to the end of their experience. That turns out to be about 20% of what we teach on this campus, believe it or not. We also require experiential and applied learning opportunities. We measure all of that through learning outcomes and student proficiency. And what we found, happily, is that RIT students and alums are pretty darn good at critical thinking. You know, I think many years ago we weren't as overt in some of our process to create the skill. I think we're getting better. But even so, I don't know whether it's we attract people that critically think or we make them. But at the end of the day, we've got a bunch to be proud of. 
We impact the community experience by a lot of events here, and just last year we started something called the Fram Award for Excellence in Applied Critical Thinking, and we award that uh, particular prize at Imagine for the faculty and student uh, exhibits that uh, have evidenced and demonstrated critical thinking. And finally, we foster discourse by hosting bright minds across the applied critical thinking landscape from all across uh, our country and our world. It's important to realize that we don't know it all, can't see it all, can't do it all. So we need to be able to look outside ourselves to get experience and expertise. So I know that RIT people love maps and things. Um, I will say when I put this thing together, it accidentally looked like a T. And if you're an RIT alumni or you've hung around us recently, you've heard a lot about T-shaped thinking. Um, in many ways, it isn't an accident. If you look at the map, you'll understand that we start by, as I talked about earlier, using and constructing evidence. Where are we getting our data and our sources? We then think about information literacy. Does it make sense? We analyze and construct arguments and then reach conclusions. This is where, as I said before, most of us stop. And then, if you're doing it well, you go into actually solving and applying a solution to the problem, if you will. And finally, we demonstrate creative and innovative approaches. What are the new things that we can do to make this all work? So this visual map just kind of shows you literally the hierarchy that it takes. So if I'm making a decision in daily life or I'm making a decision in a crisis, I'm going to need to employ every one of these steps. So for a freshman, we might get through uh, steps uh, one, two, and three, maybe four, reach conclusions. By the time we get to year three and four or even graduate school, we've pushed them through problem solving and creative approaches. You don't overtly use every step every time. You don't recognize that they're part of the decision, but I bet if you step back from some of the difficult decisions that you've had, you'll see this in yourself. And the way to actually map those decisions is pretty interesting. Sit with a piece of paper, tell yourself the story, and see if you didn't touch each one of these in the hierarchy in the process. So back to the critical thinking in action idea and thinking in general. We know that experience, capability, creativity are key to your success in crisis. So who does this particularly well? Ensemble musicians develop critical thinking skills very, very well, particularly jazz musicians. And interestingly, we find that those that do improv, and we've looked at jazz musicians, but I would also uh, believe that improv actors do a lot of this as well. Um, really have highly developed critical thinking skills. You know, we call it thinking on your feet, but it's not really thinking on your feet. If you talk to a jazz musician, and I happen to have a nephew that's a pretty accomplished one, even when they improv, they have a general idea of the construct and the structure that they're going to follow. Good jazz knows what the melody line is, follows the melody line, knows how far they can go from that melody line, and then when they must return by listening to the folks around them and listening to the bass melody and those that are creating the entire musical composition. This is also true of sports team players. Certainly, at, you know, in the football that we watch, there is a play called uh, when, when the game and the play starts. But the players have to adjust as they move down the field based on what happens with the opposing team. This is shown very well with deployed military personnel because not only do they have opposing team that is trying to do something that could be, uh, you know, rather dastardly to them, but they have an evolving environment that isn't friendly either. So how do you practice this on a smaller scale? We are not ready to go out and do our jazz sex or be on a major football team or, good Lord, maybe even be in a military theater that's, that's in crisis. You can do it by being a, po a puzzle solver, or you can do it by trying to solve an operational challenge. So I've got bomb squads here, but I don't mean bomb squads literally. I mean bombs as in, if this happened to me, how might I solve it? Can I think of a personal or professional bomb that might be emerging 
that I might have to deal with and can I pre-anticipate the kinds of decisions I might need to make. And finally, one of the friendliest places that we see a lot of skill with this is with folks that do interactive teaching. Some of this can be seen in flipped classroom work and some other things where we throw problems to students and let them wrestle with that problem. It is very difficult to be a teacher in that context because you're not quite sure what you're going to get back. Again, you're giving up the control of the environment, if you will. Difficult, but also rewarding. In all of these cases, the practicers tend to be better on average than the rest of the world. So I think there, the point is there's lots of opportunity to practice and build the skill. You can put yourself in scenarios to measure yourself, up your game. Life is certainly doing that for us too. But complexity is an opportunity to change those trajectories individually and collectively through the decisions that we make. And those collective decisions and community resilience are literally just those additive collective thinking processes across the community, all of the citizenry and all of the results at the same time. Some bottom line here, those that do well in critical thinking, crisis or not, practice. They routinely practice in environments that have a frame, but not a game. And I tell my students this all the time. They practice in an environment that has a frame, but not a game. We have a general idea what the environment and rules are, but we don't know exactly how it's going to unfold. And they have a goal, but not a path. So think about uh, when you started at RIT or you started at your first job in your career. You certainly had a goal in mind, but I doubt that you had a complete map for how you were going to get there. General ideas, certainly, not the whole path laid out. So critical thinking is useful, whether I'm floating uh, after Hurricane Andrew or Katrina or Sandy, or it's useful if I'm floating, getting ready for my next career move, my next big decision at work or personally. It really does sum up the workings of modern life. So final conclusions. Our world is evolving, certainly more complex, uncertain, and yet an opportunity to be creative. Our individual and collective success, our ability to be resilient and to thrive, depends on our collective critical thinking skills. I'd be delighted, be delighted to uh, hear any questions or thoughts that you have, either now or if you'd like to send me an email. I really thank you for the opportunity to chat with you today. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, we do actually have a couple of questions, and uh, if, if more people think of questions as we're going on here, please again enter them in the chat box and we'll try and get them covered before we wrap up today. So the first question we have, um, I'm going to read it and then I'm going to try and interpolate what we're trying to get to here. Uh, the question was, how do we prepare for incidents, crises, when fire and rescue are overwhelmed for two to three days and the neighborhood has severe damage, injuries, or death. And I think I, I'm getting out of that that the key is in these huge crises, the answer for you may not be pick up the phone and call the police because they're going to say, we'll get to you. So uh, let me say, first of all, uh, this is a great question. Um, and, and it's one that, that I've personally wrestled with uh, and professionally wrestled with. Um, on the personal side, again, I'm going to go back to this, the idea that I'm five feet tall and I've actually put myself in crisis situations in response and sometimes physically been overwhelmed by them. And I try in those cases not to be part of the problem. So. If we're going back to a disaster where the professional emergency services are overwhelmed, what we see time and time again, and this is very true, especially past 9-11, uh, I think when the, the U.S. Uh, got a collective lesson in preparedness maybe, um, that we have a lot of ad hoc resourcing. So ad hoc resourcing in terms of neighbor helping neighbor, um, neighborhood helping neighborhood. And that continues to this day. A couple of years ago, we had a massive snowstorm in, in Buffalo, New York. There were entire neighborhoods that were never plowed by the official plows and for several days post that snowstorm. 
At that point, most of them had been collectively dug out by neighbors grabbing shovels. So a couple of things, though, to get back to the specific question, what do you do when it's really overwhelming? What you do is the same things that I've said here. You've got to assess what's possible and who's available to help. And if you noticed uh, in the last uh, hurricane that we had come up the coast about a month ago, we had a lot of governors saying, get out now. We're not going to send responders in to collect you. Um, when I started in the emergency management and response business, and, well, and I have to be honest, I don't know that I ever started. My father was part of it, and I think I was born into it in some ways, whether I wanted to be or not. But back in the day, we'll say, when dirt was new, we had the idea that everybody deserved to be rescued. And certainly emergency services try, but there's only so much one human can do to help another. So a lot of this really has to go back to being individually prepared, assessing the situation, understanding what your options are. And if you can't get out, realizing the choices you might have to make that aren't maybe the best choices and the best option. So let's ask a follow-up question to that. Are there some key points that individuals need to include in a plan for home, for office. Now, most offices mm -hmm. do have, are starting to develop disaster plans and things. But if you're at home, you're looking at your family, what are the, the top five things maybe that you need to say you have to have a plan for this, a plan for this, and a plan for this? Well, there's two questions in your question. Um, the first one is, is we can all imagine the types of hazards we might encounter, and we can make plans for those. Everything from my uh, fire evacuation plan, if I'm at home or I'm in the office, and how to deal with that, and, you know, those exit drills in the home, Edith, that we all practice kids and shit still should be doing as adults or at least discussing with our families are still very true. But there's another piece to this. Uh, I, I like to say that disasters and crises are by their very nature not convenient. Um, we don't get to plan them on a Saturday morning when everyone's had their coffee and is thinking straight. Uh, these happen in inopportune times. And in the same way that we saw a lot of folks being held up with evacuations related to getting their pets, we also see the same processes, and I'm not comparing issues here, I, I want to make that clear, with fami families trying to be reunited. We might tell folks in a collective uh, evacuation, please don't go to neighborhood X. But if their mother or grandmother or God forbid their child is in that neighborhood or on the other side of that neighborhood, they sure are going to go right through harm's way to get those they love. That's just human nature. So what we really have to think about are what are the steps that we can do to help ourselves be safe and then assist others. Right? If that adage that you get when you get on a plane and they say, when we're doing the uh, practice drill, if the, uh, the uh, air mask drops from the overhead ceiling, put it on yourself first and then help another, it's because we don't want you to become part of the problem, but rather part of the solution. Can I get myself to somewhere that is reasonably safe once I know the situation isn't continuing to evolve, and then reach out to those that I care about and others to, to be part of the the solving of the problem rather than creating it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, next question uh, should be pretty easy. Does Rochester have a FEMA certification program? Uh, FEMA cert program actually is. Um, I'm sorry, a, is it not it's, certification? It's not certification. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. A, a FEMA cert program is a community emergency response team program, and Rochester has a pretty robust one. So. I happen to be an official responder for hazmat because I can barely deal with having my hazmat suit on. I certainly am not a fireman or policeman. God knows you wouldn't want me to, in either of those roles. But um, we have a great CERT program here that, that does a lot collectively. And Rochester has always had a very robust uh, response program, whether it's professional or it's volunteer, or in most cases in this region, it's a blending of the two. Um, I think we're lucky in, in that sense. Um, we actually have more participation here than most communities do. And in fact, in some of the latest data that I saw, we tend to be about 50% better in terms of participation rate than you see in other communities of our size. 
Um, we've got a comment here that uh, for people who are interested, uh, if you read the Jack Reacher mm -hmm. series by Lee Childs, it, they say that is an example of by the numbers critical thinking and skill. So I'm going to get that for Christmas for my 17-year-old. <laughs> um, one more question here. As a creative thinker who believes that I try to do my very best every day to think about the possible outcomes for each decision, what is the best way to get people around me to begin critical thinking as well? Oh boy, is that a loaded question. Um, so let me let me say this. Um, when I took this job as the, the FRAM chair, um, as an engineer, I kind of had my own perspective, and you saw a lot of it in this presentation about what critical thinking was. And boy, did I get schooled on the folks that really do critical thinking. So I put some of that in my PowerPoint, right? But one of the, the places that, that really took me to task on it the most were the NTID players that did the Sherlock Holmes play last spring. When I watched how those actors actually evolved as they put together that play, interacted with each other, managed to bring that to life from a script, I saw critical thinking at its best form in action. And what I learned in the process is that creative thinkers have to go through every one of those hierarchical steps that I talked about earlier. They just get farther than most of us on a regular basis. So they can be pretty daunting to folks that aren't used to critically thinking. And by the way, I do read the Jack Reacher series myself. Um, and that is a way to watch it in action. Um, I think you have to start with baby steps. You can't go out there, and I've tried not to go out there to be the panacea of all critical thinking. And if I thought I knew it all, uh, I think I would would uh, quit this job. I, I know enough about critical thinking to know that there's more that I need to critically learn. And, and I think that's key to the process, is getting folks to be willing to think about, talk about, um, implement their ideas. So one of the things that I like to do uh, in classes, and my husband accuses me of wanting to do at home sometimes, is hot seat thinking. I uh, give a question or a problem that doesn't have a direct answer, a little muddled, if you will, and I say, so how would you figure this out? And I literally put a student on a hot seat, and then I say, you can go get a friend to help you think through this, and I want to hear you think out loud. Talk to each other. And when you do things like that, and when you have those conversations, you can see a process in front of you, and then you can actually react to it. The difficult part here is you can't ever uh, show yourself as, as the, the expert, um, because I think we all have our own styles in critical thinking. Um, we all have our own nuances in critical thinking that are related to our experience and capabilities, as I talked about. Um, but we all do employ pieces of those steps in the hierarchy, as I, as I noted earlier. Okay, one last question. Um, in your opinion, do you find that the current work environment in corporate world encourages critical thinking or discourages it? So if you're thinking in terms of legal controls that are put in place, driving to standardization of reaction and response and customer experience, driving to uh, templating and very process-driven environments, does that increase critical thinking or does it tend to tamp it down? I, another great question. I, I think it can do both, and I hate to hedge my bets on this, but uh, as, as a risk engineer and somebody that came out of environmental health and safety, I spent a lot of my career making sure that we were in compliance, that we were doing the right things uh, to go beyond compliance and get ourselves positioned towards sustainability as the right thing to do. But we had a framework in, in which to do that, right? So every decision, whether we uh, overtly understand it or not, has a framework. It has some rules to it. Right? The, the idea of being a critical thinker, though, is can you use those rules and those frames and that data to inform what you're doing and make a better decision? 
So a lot of times the processes in corporate America, and I spent the first half of my career there, um, are nice places to hide under if, if you want to say, well, the system is making me do this or the system requires it. It doesn't have as much to do with critical thinking as it does being able to explain that decision or that process or the reason why we need to change to somebody else. So uh, some of the recent work at RIT that we have um, pushed on is that the crux or the interconnection between critical thinking, ethics, and communication, because none of those happens uh, alone. You know, a critically well thought out decision ought to have an ethical basis to it. Otherwise, we're just making dastardly people that could be out there for ruin and destruction, if you will. Um, and at the same time, every decision deserves an explanation not only to see how it was thought out, but why it should be implemented. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to wrap up. Uh, we want to thank Jennifer for being here. Any additional questions can be emailed to ritalum at rit.edu or tweeted to at rit underscore alumni with the hashtag meritwebinars, and we will direct your questions to Dr. Schneider. Dr. Schneider also left her email up on her last slide, so you can certainly contact her directly as well. Note that all participants